Hey everybody, Nate here, and today we're going to talk about how to put a computer together. This is one of the more important lectures if you are a student in one of my programs that I'm teaching at, uh, but if you're just some random guy on the internet, hopefully you get something out of this too. I think there's a little bit of everything in here from more, you know, how a computer works at a basic level type of concepts all the way up to the history and the more advanced uh, reasons why we would use, let's say, ECC memory over non-ECC memory um, or specific types of hard drives in certain situations. I think if you're somebody who has never built a computer before or you're somebody who's built a handful of computers, you're still gonna get something out of this. Uh, there's Again, there's something here for everybody. And ultimately, you're not just gonna learn how to get a computer put together, but also how to get the best bang for your buck when you do different things. I am building a new channel here aimed at teaching poorly taught security concepts, things that I feel like took too long for me to learn in my career, things that I could have learned earlier or been taught better. And so hopefully you get something out of this. If you do, really appreciate a like on the video so we can get out to more people. Uh, for more of it, subscribe to the channel. But with that said, let's get right into the video. All right, so before we get into the components you need to build your gaming computer or whatever you want to do, we're going to talk about some history. And the first computer that was ever built was a machine commissioned by the U.S. Army, like many projects of the day. A lot of the early computing machines were commissioned by the military for research purposes. And it was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, the ENIAC, and it was designed to calculate artillery ranges. So the military wanted a machine that could basically generate artillery range sheets uh, for the Army. And it was developed by the University of Pennsylvania, started construction in 1943, lasted three years, finished in 1946, and it was basically a giant series of electronic circuits. Uh, technically, all computers are that, um, but by electronic circuits, I literally mean it was glass tubes and resistors and capacitors all put onto circuit boards in a 30 by 50 foot room. And you can imagine 30 by 50 foot room, you know, today we have computers that will fit in the palm of my hand. But back in the day, this was still 10,000 times faster than doing this math out by hand, uh, which is how they were doing it before that. Uh, in fact, this computer had a clock speed of about a million hertz uh, a second, which again, not much compared to today's standards of multiple gigahertz a second, but that was very, very quick for the time. Um, so let's do some comparison, right? Uh, I, I mentioned that it is a 30 by 50 foot room. We have machines that nest in the palm of my hand. The example of being the Raspberry Pi, which I put up on the screen for you to see now. Raspberry Pi has a clock speed of 1.4 billion operations a second rather than 1 million operations a second. And that's on four cores, which means that a Raspberry Pi, again, something that fits in the palm of my hand, is roughly 5,600 times faster than a machine that took up a 50 by 30 foot room back in, in the early you know, 1940s, 1950s. In fact, the fastest processors today can do speed clock speeds on each core of over five gigahertz, which means that they're not just 5,600 times faster, but you know, hundreds of thousands of times faster than the, the old computers. And not just processing speed, these newer computers can store a lot more information too. Uh, ENIAC was only able to store 320 bits. And uh, this was, you know, compared, this is compared to consumer hard drives we can buy today that can store 18 terabytes of information. Uh, for reference, that is 400 billion times more storage on the modern, modern devices. And again, that's, that's bits to bytes. So there are eight bits in a byte. The modern hard drives can do 18 terabytes. The old ENIAC could only do 320 bits. That's 321 and zeros. One commonality between them though is that both the ENIAC and modern computers needed to post. And so now we're going to talk about what a post operation is and how that helps us uh, ensure that our machines are working. All right, so what is a post and how does it help us? Post stands for power on self-test and it's a way for us to ensure that our hardware is working when the computer boots. Historically, this has been identified by a beep. So when you turn your computer on and you hear a beep, maybe not on newer computers, but at least on older, older desktops, that beep is the result of a post. Uh, and so this test is basically a verification that runs very quickly after the machine boots uh, through the BIOS, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then the post. And so if it succeeds, we know that our hardware is working. Now, technically, in order to get a computer to boot, the only thing you need is the hardware required to post. And there are four things. You need the ability to think, so you need a processor. You need the ability to remember things quickly, and so you need memory or RAM. 
you need power for those devices. So you need a power supply and you need a motherboard to connect them, all those devices together. And so with those four things, uh, processor, memory, motherboard to connect things and a power supply to provide power, you're able to successfully pass a power on self test and boots into the operating system. Uh, you'll also potentially want a graphics card because without a graphics chip, you won't be able to see anything. But most often, at least with modern computers, there is a graphics chip built into the motherboard. And you can identify that by whether or not the motherboard has a display port on it, which most do. So now we're going to talk about those four components that are required to post. We'll talk about the other things like graphics cards and network cards and storage later. Uh, but the first thing we're going to talk about is power, uh, is a processor. So a central processing unit, a CPU, is what your computer uses to perform its operations. It's what serves as the brain of the computer. It's what provides the thought process when you are, you're doing operations, whether that's opening a calculator and doing some math or running a game, actually getting the game to start up and all that kind of stuff. The processor is what does all that, uh, what makes the decisions. And processors have threads and cores. So a core of a processor is basically uh, a way for a processor to do multiple things at once. Back in the day, like ENIAC times, we had single core machines. And that means that one, it could only execute one instruction at a time. And while this is really quick, so we can kind of simulate multiple things happening at once by sort of passing a talking stick around, like saying, all right, your turn, your turn to talk and your turn to talk and your turn to talk very quickly. Uh, it's not technically true parallel threads. And so today we have multiple cores on our processors that allow us to do multiple things at once in true parallel. And this sort of talking stick thing still happens, but we are doing true multi-threading. Uh, now, sometimes you'll see, generally you'll see processors advertised as cores and threads. So you'll have like an eight core processor with 16 threads. And that's because of something called hyper-threading. And so if we enable hyper-threading, each core can do two operations a second based on how the sort of transistors are arranged on it. And while this isn't a true double efficiency, it does give us about a 30% boost on each core. So most processors today use something called hyper-threading. Now, processors are really just a big series of transistors. So like I talked about glass tubes with ENIAC, uh, transistors are just, you send two bits and you send, say, a one and a zero or a zero and a zero, and the transistor uh, is you know, configured, the chemicals are configured so that it outputs a one or it outputs a zero. And the way we arrange our transistors in the processor in the silicon allows us to program certain things. And so if we feed a certain series of ones or a certain series of zeros, uh, we're going to get certain decisions on the other side. And this process is called an instruction set. And so most modern processors today are either AMD or Intel for desktop computers, and they run the x86 instruction set, which Intel developed uh, back in the uh, 70s or 80s. AMD, however, is responsible for developing x86-64, which is the 64-bit specification and is what most modern computers are actually running. So Intel developed the original 32-bit. AMD uh, has developed the 64-bit uh, specification, and they, short, they sort of share these specifications amongst each other uh, due to how the machines have developed over time, how the companies have developed over time. The last thing that we need to remember about processors is that the manufacturer of the processor, so either AMD or Intel, uh, when they send them out for fabrication, they send them out with a socket specification. And so the socket is the physical dimensions of the processor. It's where the pins are, and it tells the motherboard manufacturer where to accept the input or send data to. Uh, based on that that pinout and so we need our pinout we need our socket uh, specification when we go to select our motherboard so that our processor is actually compatible with the board that we choose so i know that was a lot of information all you need to remember from this section if you're getting just into this stuff is that the processor is the brain of the computer it's what makes decisions for the machine and if you're choosing a processor you just need to remember the socket so that you can choose a motherboard that is compatible with the processor Next thing we're going to talk about is the motherboard. So the motherboard is, it can be thought of as a series of train tracks that allows data from, to get from point A to point B and conductors that direct that traffic from place to place. And so generally speaking, a motherboard is just a big circuit board. It's a big printed circuit board with electronic traces that get data from place to place. And it's got sockets that we can plug our processor into, that we can plug our memory into uh, to get that information either computed and sent somewhere or stored and retrieved. The BIOS, the basic input output system, is what the computer uses. It's code the computer runs when it first starts up. So when you press the power button, it's the first thing that runs. 
and it helps get your computer running, get the postcode and, and all that good stuff. Uh, that code is stored on something called a CMOS chip uh, or CMOS chip. And that stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It's just a memory chip that uh, holds data as long as it has power. And there's a little dime battery on the motherboard that retains power to the board. Used to be that we would have to replace that uh, battery every you know five or six years. Today, boards are efficient enough that that battery generally li lasts the life of the computer. Uh, but if you need to reset your BIOS, one way to do that is to pull the battery off the, off the board. And on the screen right now, you see that battery on a motherboard. But that's a way to pull data off um, that CMOS chip or clear that CMOS chip if, uh, if you need to reset your BIOS. The last important component about motherboards is that you have two microprocessors. So remember I said we have train tracks and we have conductors. Well, the conductor part is those two microprocessors. And that's the north bridge and the south bridge. And so the north bridge, uh, it is north is above south, north is higher. And uh, higher processes more data, bigger things, right? That's how I remember it at least. And so the North Bridge is the component that connects the high-speed devices together. And we're talking relatively here. So things like the processor and the memory that are talking at potentially over 200 gigabit a second. Uh, and then things that are slower, like your PCI lanes that hold your graphics card or hold, uh, you know, a network card that you might have or, uh, you know, Ethernet ports, that kind of stuff. All of those types of communications that happen at lower speed, again, relatively, we're talking maybe 40 gig a second or less, uh, are going to be handled by the South Bridge. And so those two microprocessors, the North Bridge and the South Bridge, which I'll highlight again on the screen for you, are the two chips that direct traffic. They're your, they're your train conductors that direct the data around the train tracks. And if you only remember one thing from this section, just remember that the motherboard is the way that, de that devices connect to each other and talk to each other. And it is, it is essentially the data getting sent from place to place. Uh, our motherboard needs to be compatible with our processor, so we need to have the same socket type for the motherboard and the processor. And we need to remember the memory socket as well for when we choose our, our memory, which is what we're going to talk about next. All right, so random access memory. Random access memory. This is a series of, of little chips that hold information, and RAM is used to store things that need to be accessed quickly that we're going to retrieve later by running processes. So not things that we need to store like files, but you can think of it as like program memory. So if you're using a calculator app or something, when you would uh, say like you, you put a one in and then you add one to it and you get two, well that two that's displayed on the screen, that data is either stored um, in RAM or stored in the processor. But in most cases, in this case, we're talking about it being stored in RAM. And so your, your RAM's gonna have a speed associated with it, just like the processor uh, has a speed associated with that for operations a second. Your RAM is going to be rated by how much data you can send to it and retrieve from it per second. Uh, generally, that's about in the range of three gigabyte a second uh, for, for most modern memory. And there are two types of memory. So there's ECC memory and non-ECC memory. ECC, error correcting code memory, is a special type of memory that servers use and higher, higher uh, let's say, importance machines that need to ensure that their memory is always going to be consistent. And it's got a technology that allows it to fix issues as they come up very quickly. Um, so you have a lot more robust hardware when you do that. However, ECC memory really isn't necessary for desktop computers. It's for critical applications uh, like servers that domain infrastructure like big businesses are using uh, run on. So for our desktop purposes, we're going to use non-ECC memory because it's a lot more affordable. And so the only thing, if you're going to remember one thing from this section is that your memory needs to be compatible with your motherboard, so you need to know what the pinout is. There's a certain number of pins it has, and that should match your motherboard. And then, uh, ideally, your motherboard needs to be able to handle the speed of the, the RAM, but in general, most, most situations it will. Um, and uh, that, that's pretty much it. You just need to know the pinout, the, the pinout matches, and then the speed matches, and you should be good to go. So once you plug your sticks of RAM in, uh, you need to power the whole computer. And to do that, you need a power supply. And so a power supply is, a, is one of the more simple components in the machine. It's basically just a transformer that takes your 120 volt wall power, AC wall power, that comes into your house or your apartment or whatever it is, and converts it into DC line voltage, meaning uh, basically lower voltages that the computer can use to power different things. And the power supply will have different cables that go to different things because different devices take different amounts of power. And so it used to be that these cables were marked by color, so different voltages would be different colors. However, today, 
most of the time these cables are all black or they're all one color and the voltage indication is done by the the shape of the end of the cable so you'll either have like a polygon or you'll have like a square or rectangle or something like that and the different shapes ensure that you can't plug say a 12 volt cable into a 5 volt port and fry the device uh, without like really jamming it in there which believe me i've seen people do that so if it doesn't it's not going in easy definitely don't force it because those are different voltages if the shapes are not matching the other important thing about power supplies is that they will have an efficiency rating so generally this ranges from silver to platinum and it's a measure of how much a dc power is generated based off your ac input and so this is more important when you're buying a more powerful power supply so say like if you're buying something 1200 volts or, or higher you would really really care about your efficiency because you want to ensure that you know the margins are bigger right like 10 percent of a thousand is a lot more than 10 percent of 500 and so if you're building a really powerful machine you generally want to get an efficient power supply so that you you actually are you know not using as much wall power to do the same operations uh, however you don't want to get a big power supply if you're not going to be using all that power because under about 20 percent so when your computer is idle the power supply is really inefficient. Uh, you're using a lot more wall power than you're actually absorbing on the DC end, on the, on the computer side of the power supply. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to get a 1200 watt power supply if you're only going to use 400 watts most of the time. And generally speaking, people buy bi much bigger power supplies than they need, and they don't realize that they're actually very inefficient. They're using much more wall power to power that computer than they need to be, and it's because they spent way too much money on their power supply. So... Use online calculators to, to determine how much power you need and don't overspend on your power supply. Generally, uh, what you should remember from this section is that you want to get a power supply that fits your needs uh, and you want to get an efficiency that supports your, your goals. So if you need uh, a lot of power, you're going to want something that's more efficient. But that's about it. Now, the last thing you need to post is a graphics card or a graphics chip. Generally, in modern days, like I said, these are going to be built into the motherboard, but not always. Uh, if you don't see a display port on the motherboard, that means you're going to need to buy an external graphics card if you want to see anything. And so this is really, again, really uncommon in, in modern day. Uh, but one thing you will see, and this will be in the troubleshooting section of this video as well, is that if you plug a display into the motherboard when you have a graphics card, the graphics card isn't going to get used. So if you're using a graphics card, you want to make sure that your displays are actually plugged into the graphics card, not your motherboard, or you're going to run into a bunch of problems. All right, so this is going to be a quicker, quicker section of the video, but I just want to make the point that things like phones and routers are actually computers too. Uh, generally speaking, they run on the same hardware. They need a processor. They need memory. They have Ethernet ports for connecting things, like in the case of a router. But at the root level, they're all sort of just, you know, they're all sort of computers. And so I'm going to put on the screen right now a picture of a phone's motherboard, and you'll be able to see that we have a hard drive, we have memory, uh, we have a power supply in the form of a battery, right? And we have a display, and that's obviously connected to these devices so that you can do things like touch the screen. Instead of a mouse, obviously, you're going to have touch input. Uh, instead of a keyboard, you'll have your phone keyboard via touch, but it's, it's all the same thing. So you've got an input-output system in the display, and you've got all of your hardware accessible under the, under the hood. And they're all basically, the, it's just a computer. Uh, same thing with a router. You've got Ethernet ports. I'll put a, a picture of a router's motherboard on the screen as well. Uh, you've got memory. You've got a, a processor. You've got a power supply that you plug into the wall. Uh, and it's, it's basically just doing computational operations to accomplish its goal. Um, so actually, you can virtualize a router. You can, you can create a virtual router on your computer. We're going to do another video on virtualization, so we'll, we'll cover that in a later video. But the point here is that phones and routers are computers too. Uh, most things that... Uh, are performing operations for either a company or you know network devices that kind of stuff that you connect to and interact with uh, all run standard hardware like we've talked about and they may have a post post test you know avionic systems like on a, on a airplane are technically computers too they still have processors memory all that kind of stuff um, but things like their post test they're not going to make a beat maybe they'll send diagnostics to a central system or something like that um, so just remember most devices that turn on you interact with have this kind of hardware so whether it's a server a desktop computer avionics systems a phone a router a switch any sort of networking gear at a root level they are all computers okay so before we cover the last part of this video which is basically like going into 
different types of builds and why you would want to use specific parts and specific scenarios or spend more money on certain components of a build, we need to talk about the last two auxiliary components that people generally use that are sort of optional, that you don't need for a post to succeed, but most people are using on their systems uh, in a common way. And so the first of those is storage, meaning a hard drive, not to be confused with RAM, and the second is a graphics card. And so storage generally means a hard drive, right? And we're talking about things that we would use to store files. So long-term storage, when you turn the computer off, the memory is not erased, that, that file stays in memory and storage, uh, and it, it's a way for us to store files long-term. So hard drives are much cheaper per gigabyte than RAM. Uh, it may be you know, 50 to $100 for 16 gigabytes of RAM, or even more if you're buying really high-end stuff, whereas you can get a, you know, a two terabyte hard drive for $50, so 2,000 gigabytes for $50. And that's because it's much slower. So a standard traditional hard drive uses disks inside. And I'll put a picture of that on the screen. Uh, and that is because it's, it's cheaper to do it like that. Uh, the other type of hard drive is a solid state hard drive, meaning it doesn't have any moving pieces. And it, you can think of it like a big USB drive. And that is a little bit more expensive, but it's a lot faster. So in fact, there are multiple types of, of SSDs, solid state drives. Uh, the first being... Uh, sort of basically a USB stick and a lot of those types of chips. The other type being something, uh, a form factor called M2, which is sort of bleeding edge for today in 2021, uh, released a few years ago, and M2 are a lot faster than even standard solid states. You can get M2 hard drives that you can read and write about a gigabyte a second to. Granted, they are expensive, but that is only about a third as slow as RAM, as memory, like as, as sticks of RAM. Uh, however, a traditional hard drive is about a tenth of the speed of that. Like a traditional hard drive is about 125 megabytes a second to maybe 250. Uh, and you can see that is a lot different than your RAM. And so if you need to write a lot of data or you need quick access to stuff, I'm generally going to want to get a faster hard drive. But a hard drive is a way for us to store persistent information in memory rather than uh, standard fast access stuff that would be accessed by programs and would be discarded very quickly uh, upon loss of power. Now, the last thing is where all of you gamers should be paying attention. So graphics cards are used to do the graphical, obviously, graphical calculations on a computer. And it's effectively a small computer within your computer. So a graphics card is a board that has a processor and a memory uh, component on it, just like you have RAM and a processor in your, in your computer and the main components. Uh, and those two things on the graphics card, the processor and the memory on the graphics card, are specifically designed for graphical operations. So generally, the memory on the graphics card is something called GDDR uh, whatever, whereas you would have DDR whatever uh, memory on your, on your main computer. And the processor is specifically built, it's not Intel or AMD, it's specifically built to do things like linear algebra very efficiently so that it can calculate the vectors and physics that are required for games and displaying things on a screen uh, more efficiently than a, in a central processor would. And the idea is that we want to reduce the load on the processor by having a separate component that's very good at graphical pro uh, processing. So if you are playing PC games and you want really fast frame rate, you'll generally upgrade your graphics card or spend more money on your graphics card than you would on other components of the, of the machine. Uh, sometimes you also want more memory, more memory both in the graphics card and the machine, the machine itself. Uh, but the point being that the graphics card is really important for anybody playing games or doing video editing, anything that is very visually intensive that's doing a lot of things. Or if you know, you're running a high resolution screen, you want a very powerful graphics card, that kind of stuff. So if you can remember any, anything from this section, remember that hard drives uh, remember things permanently. They're persistent storage. And... Traditional hard drives use a disk, whereas solid state hard drives are using no moving parts. They're effectively a flash drive, a big flash drive. And for graphics cards, remember that GPUs are just a computer inside your computer with their own processor memory, specifically focused on doing graphical things, doing graphical calculations very efficiently. Okay, and so now for the last part of this video, what I think is probably going to be the most interesting to you, we're going to go on PCPartPicker.com and we're going to build a uh, a few components of a machine so I can show you how the site works, as well as show you the difference between a few computed, uh, completed builds. And the awesome thing about this site is not only can you figure out what parts you need and what parts are compatible and what parts aren't compatible, you can also look at other builds that other people have put together and published on the site to get ideas for what you want to do. 
So right off the bat, we have the system builder. We just go to the site and click system builder here. Uh, and we're gonna go and select a processor. And so you can scroll down and look at the different ones. You can select by rating, by price, whatever. Uh, I'm gonna go with the 3950, which is one of the uh, most popular current uh, you know, top end Ryzen processors, AMD Ryzen. Uh, that's their desktop line. We'll add it here. And then this needs a cooler. It doesn't come with one, some of them do. Uh, but we'd choose a cooler here. It doesn't really matter. I'll just use this cooler master. I just need something that's going to be sufficient. This is a pretty powerful processor, so you need something that actually is capable of cooling it. And then uh, scrolling down a little bit, we, let's select a motherboard. So let's grab, let's grab this Tough Gaming 8570. And you'll notice as we do this, the only socket that's available, remember we talked about socket compatibility between the processor and the motherboard. Well, the socket that this processor uses, the AMD AM4 socket, this one right here. And this socket is not going to be selected for an Intel processor, but you'll notice everything else, all these LGA sockets or Intel sockets are not selected. They're grayed out because we can't use them. And so automatically when you start populating this list, everything can kind of gets assembled and it'll only show you options that are compatible with your build. And so let's just grab the first one. Let's grab this Tough Game 8570, add that to the list. And the last thing, because we didn't cover it earlier, uh, motherboards have a, a format, so they have a size format. Most common desktop motherboards are ATX. Now there's micro ATX and extended ATX, uh, and it basically just refers to the physical side of the cir size of the circuit board. And so when you choose a, a case, you need to choose something that is compatible with your motherboard. You'll see this is an ATX motherboard, so we need to get a case that can house an ATX motherboard. So we go to choose a case. It's gonna We can scroll down and see... Uh, the type, there's ATX full tower, which would be like a bigger box or a mid tower, which would be like kind of a mid-sized box or a micro tower, mini ATX, uh, micro ATX, mini ATX. This is gonna be compatible with our board because we have an ATX board. And if we tried to put that ATX board in a micro ATX case, it wouldn't fit. So we need something that's the same. We'll just use ATX full tower here. And then we could choose this thermal take, you know, whatever you wanna do. This is a thousand dollar case, so we'll probably not choose that one. Uh, but you could choose whatever you wanted here. Uh, let's just use this Asus. Uh, you can get a very cheap cases. You can get fifty, hundred dollar cases, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's basically how this works. So you populate this all out, and you'll notice as we do it up in the top right, you get a wattage estimation. And if you remember back to our discussion about power supplies, you want something that's going to approximately give you what you actually need, nothing more, nothing less. And so this wattage will help you choose your power supply at the, at the end. And you want to use your power supply last. You just need it to be compatible with the board and the case, or excuse me, just the, just the case, it should be compatible with your motherboard, uh, and it needs to be the right size, and so you can get that from here. Now the second part of this is I'm gonna show you some completed builds and the differences between them. So this first one is a build for a programmer. Said this, this guy, I put a comment, he said, his friend uh, blew up his, his old box, and this guy just decided to build him a new one as a gift, and you'll see what did he spend his money on. Um, it's kind of insane. He spent a bunch of money on, a, on a, a cooler. But the point here that I want to make is if you look at this it, at this video card, it's a one gigabyte uh, Sapphire Radeon 50, uh, 450. This is a very cheap card. This thing is probably under $100 right now. It's not even listed as a price. Uh, but very cheap card compared to our other build here. And you'll notice they spent more money on the processor. This is uh, a couple hundred dollar processor at the time we're recording this. The next one, 100 terabyte NAS. Where do you think they spend all their money? Well, a NAS is network attached storage, so they want storage. And if you look at the description, it says, I needed a large quantity of storage for work and home data, files and media. And so let's think back to the earlier in the video, what do we use for storage? We use hard drives. Hard drive is for persistent storage rather than memory, which is for quick access stuff that's gonna be lost when the computer gets powered down. And so if you look at the build, they spent $380 per hard drive for 10 terabyte hard drives one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten terabyte hard drives for three hundred eighty dollars a piece, and uh, of course that's where they spent the most, uh, the majority of the money for this build, which makes sense because it's NAS, it's network attached storage. Uh, the per it wouldn't make a lot of sense to buy a really expensive graphics card for this if it's just the whole point of the machine is to be used for storing stuff. And then the last one we have here is kind of a monster gaming PC, uh, four thousand dollars price tag on this. Um, so about the same cost as the last machine. I think the last one was probably five grand. Uh, but you'll look if you look at this, notice that they spent three thousand dollars on their graphics card. 
builds four thousand dollars they spent three thousand dollars three quarters of that uh total price tag on the graphics card and that's because this is a gaming pc it's designed to do graphical intensive work uh and if like this guy says he's a he's a modder uh and he needs that performance but he wouldn't spend the money on hard drives because he doesn't need the storage right the games aren't going to be more than a 500 gig to a terabyte or something like that uh it makes sense to spend the money on the graphics card and so that's what he did and this is going to be a very efficient gaming pc just like this would be a very efficient nas and this wouldn't be good for gaming so you really want to build into the specific things you need and it just depends on what you want um, but hopefully these examples kind of give you an idea of how to make those decisions and if you want some inspiration you can go to these completed builds and take a look around if you are seeing this, thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. Uh, if you learned anything or found this useful, I'd appreciate a like on the video so we can get this out to more people. Subscribe to the channel if you want more of this. I do these videos about three times a week. So if you do subscribe, you should get another video in just a few days here. Uh, I do these videos on cybersecurity concepts, hacking concepts, offensive security stuff, uh, professional penetration tester um, at, at my work. So a lot of that kind of stuff I bring back to these videos. Um, but with all that behind us, I hope you learned something from the video. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys in just a few days.